And how do we demystify this whole idea of a scientific paper? So first I'll tell you what I will discuss with you today. It's journal paper writing. Um, the first thing I'll do is I'll give you some resources because I'm far from being the only one who uh, has information about this for you. I'm gonna talk in the beginning about plagiarism because it's such an important topic and one that uh, I think is, is a little misunderstood. So I'm gonna talk briefly about it, but I, I like to give it some, some place. Um, and then of course, I'm gonna go through the basic structure of all journal papers. Uh, I'll actually take some examples from the IEEE and the Optical Society of America, OSA. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a lot about organization and clarity because I think this is um, uh, critical to being uh, really successful in your uh, paper writing. And then I'm gonna talk a lot about figures because we're talking about scientific papers and uh, figures are such an important uh, aspect of getting your ideas across. So if that is what I'm going to talk about, um, oh, I should say that this is about journal paper writing, but it's really pretty similar to conference paper writing. Of course, in conference papers, you have to be a bit more succinct, but a lot of the organization and clarity figures, all of this applies equally well uh, to conferences as well as journals. So what am I not going to discuss? If that's what I'm discussing. You know, I'm not going to talk about thesis and proposal writing, and really it's very different. Some of, of course, some of the uh, aspects of writing will remain the same, but but uh, still the, the organization, the typical organization is going to be focused on the journal paper. The objectives are what you want to achieve with journal paper and that's going to be different for a thesis or proposal. I'm not going to talk about the, how you submit to a journal, what the journal does to review your paper, what happens when you get reviewers you have to respond to, who should be the authors, who should you acknowledge, what should the references look like, how do you format them, copyright issues, all that I'm not going to talk about but I will tell you where you can find information about all these things. Because of course, when you're writing a journal paper, all of these other aspects are also important in, uh, in that writing. So as I mentioned, uh, I work with uh, two uh, organizations. I work with the IEEE and I work with the OZA, which uh, is the Optical Society of America. And they both are very good about providing you with a lot of resources. And uh, so I mentioned the IEEE uh, website here, and I'll be taking quite a few um, of the content I'm presenting is coming from a uh, video that they have online. Um, they also have a monthly newsletter, which I subscribe to, which is really useful because of course, if you want to learn about writing, you're gonna maybe sit through this seminar now, you're going to maybe read uh, some documentation now, but you won't be like doing this all the time, but the, a monthly newsletter sort of forces you to catch up every month on a couple issues that maybe you hadn't thought about. And sort of it distributes this process of learning more about uh, being an effective writer. Um, so I find that very useful. Um, I think I'll take just a second to visit these two websites that I mentioned. Oh, I, the OSA website, they have a, a document called Publishing Your Manuscript. And I'm going to also be stealing a couple of their um, uh, um, uh, bullets, uh, items that you should be following. So I'll be taking a little bit from each of those. I'd like to acknowledge them because I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. So uh, here is the uh, IEEE webpage, which is what they call the Author Center. And they have some nice video tutorials and they have this subscribe to our newsletter. So I suggest you to use this. If I go under Author Tools, that's um, some of the uh, other issues I said I won't be covering today, they're going to be covered in that. Same thing with the video tutorials. So writing your article of journal publication I'll be mentioning. And also, uh, I think there's one about picking your title uh, somewhere around here. Um, title and abstract. So those are some interesting things you might want to follow up on if you want more information. And in OZA, they have this tips for preparing and publishing your manuscript. And of course they take you through the whole process of what happens when you submit and you know how you should select your authors. All those titles that I said I won't be covering, uh, they're available to you in these uh, other locations. I also would like to point out a real gem that I found on YouTube, um, Scientific Writing by Professor Lipson. And uh, a lot, some of the ideas I'll talk about I won't go into as much detail about because she covers them very well. And so I don't wanna do the same thing she did, 
uh, but really a real gem. And what's even more fun is that uh, Professor Lipson was the first woman to be named uh, a Tyndall Award recipient, and that was just last year. So if I give you a chance to learn more about writing and learn more about a really inspiring researcher, you know, I've sort of achieved two things today. So um, plagiarism, it's uh, mentioned in this IEEE and they give you a definition and it's using someone else's ideas, processes, results, or words without explicitly acknowledging the original source. So you have to, of course, submit your own work. Uh, I think that's uh, quite clear to everyone. Um, uh, so, that's obvious, maybe that's obvious, but there are some subtleties, which is why I wanted to uh, mention it. For instance, um, you, you can take an idea from somebody else's paper to say, my idea is similar to this, but it's different in this way. But of course you have to acknowledge them, which is why we have references at the end of our uh, journal paper. So that's fine, but you cannot just take their exact words. So even if you put a citation, everybody knows that you're quoting from this paper. If it's really a quote, if you use their exact words, then you have to use quotation marks. If you're putting it in your own words, well, then uh, you don't need quotation marks, but you, of course, you still need the citations. And this applies um, uh, to you know, text, figures, results, whatever. So, the rules are really inflexible. So that's why I mentioned it. You know, you cannot get around this. You cannot think, oh, this time they're gonna let it go. It's not true. If, if, they, if someone in the whole review cycle for your journal um, recognizes plagiarism, uh, it, it will not go away. It will not be, okay, you can. Um, and also I'd like to say it's very easily detected. It's very obvious when someone is reusing words. There's so many tools now uh, they, they talk here about the cross-check similarity. Um, so there's many online tools that allow editors to find uh, this taking their exact words. So you know, like, really don't do it. And very serious consequences. Remember, the text that you write yourself that is awful English is still better than copying. So I think a lot of motivation is, is well intended. They think that the original document was written in very clear English, very easy to understand. You want to make, in your paper, you want to make sure it's easily understood, but you, you really have to put it in your own words. And even if you risk having poor English or less clear, at least you will avoid all the serious consequences with plagiarism. So don't, don't make that uh, uh, mistake. So I'd like to think about this plagiarism to, to bring me into the idea of confidence. I think you should all have confidence in what you're doing. This idea of, I, it's very well explained, I'm just going to copy the same words because that's clear. But well, have confidence in yourself. You know, you, you, you do not need to plagiarize. This is not a good motivation. What you have to do is you have to, you can, and you really must develop your communication skills. It's really so important for your whole career. I'm gonna be talking to you today about, you know, some ways to develop those skills. And there are a lot more other ways. But all I can say is it's uh, going to be something that makes you effective in your job, in your career, in your advancement, uh, if you can communicate well. And that goes whether it's oral communication or written communications. Of course, we're going to be talking about today about written communications, uh, specifically for a journal article. There are fortunately lots of software tools out there to help you. So even if English is not your first language and it's very challenging for you, uh, you're going to need help from different sources. You know, you're going to have to uh, study. You're going to have to um, uh, get help from others. You're going to have to have a good editor. But there's also a lot of software tools that you can use in terms of spell checking. First of all, is you know like a no-brainer. You really have to use those. But there's a lot of grammar um, checkers out there uh, that that can help you with usage. Uh, in addition to just being grammatically correct. So it'll point out grammatical errors, but it'll also give you suggestions if the usage isn't, uh, is unusual and to, to suggest some uh, better usage. So lots of tools out there, might as well uh, uh, take, take advantage of them. 
And next, the other idea I have to do that, that I think is related to this idea of confidence, have confidence in yourself, is to realize that clarity makes the very best impression. We all want to make a good impression on others. We want When people read our journal articles, they want to uh, see that we are accomplished researchers, that what we're doing is interesting and important. And if you want to make that best impression, then you should be clear. Because a lot of people make the mistake that they should make things look complicated. That if you want to impress somebody, if you want to succeed, you want to have a very high impact paper, that it should show all the complications that were involved in it. That's not true. Uh, if you really, really want to succeed, it should not be appear to the person as being complicated. It should appear as being clear and that they could uh, understand what it is that you did. Um, so confidence. So don't be afraid that if you make it clear, people will think it looks too easy. Uh, that's not the case. If it's clear, they're more likely to cite it. They're more likely to use it. It's more likely to be a stepping stone to further development. Which brings me to the question, why do we write papers? Why are we interested in writing a journal paper? Certainly, we're writing it to get an advanced degree. You want a master's degree, you want a PhD, and this is the way to get it. Um, certainly, that's true. And that is a very valid motivation for writing papers. But I think that that's all related to you want to get your ideas out there. You want people to know what you're doing. You want them to read it. If you want them to read your paper, then you have to write it well. And you also want it to have impact. Like I said, if it's understood, it's more likely that other researchers will pick up on your ideas. They'll say, oh, that's very promising. It's interesting. Hey, I have an idea. Maybe we could also add this other technique to it. And when you look back at your career and you say, how successful was I? It's what you did, but it's also what others did because of what you did. Um, to have impact is where I think this idea of clarity uh, becomes clear that it's not it's complicated if it's so complicated maybe people will be impressed I don't think so but maybe they'll be impressed by how complicated it is but they won't know how to use it and they won't be able to build on it and go further and uh, uh, wherever you go in your career when you want to talk about your career and say uh, what great things you accomplished uh, an important aspect is showing that impact and so really working towards impact is uh, really behind a lot of the ideas uh, that I'm going to communicate today. There's an expression in English about what's the most important part of selling a house. If you have a house, what are the three most important things when you want to sell your house? And the real estate agent will tell you it's location, location, location. Wherever your house is, you want to be a nice place, then you'll get a better price for it. But in a journal paper, I'm adopting the same idea, but I'm calling it revision, revision, revision. You cannot have a good paper by writing it the first time. I cannot. I've been writing hundreds of documents, hundreds of documents, and I never sit down, write a document, and it's over. I always have to go back, go back over it, edit it, improve it. There are no shortcuts. If I can only convince you that you are perhaps early in your career, if you're taking the time to listen to me, uh, you're early in your career, so you haven't much experience. So of course, revision is important to you, but it's not that. It's not because you're new that, oh, I have to revise. No, everybody has to revise. And the more you revise, the better your document is. No shortcuts. You should expect multiple revisions. When I say revisions, I said three times. I don't, I don't think three times is usually enough. Um, multiple revisions. And I don't mean that you do a version and you give it to your an advisor and your advisor gives you revisions and you go back. No, I'm talking about self revisions. I'm talking about the number of times you go over that document before you turn it in to your um, collaborators to get uh, in, uh, input and feedback and, and make greater improvements. Of course, the more people involved, you know, the more possibility there is to uh, find areas that could be improved, to have new ideas on how to organize. That's all, that all can happen. So all kinds of revisions are important, but self-revisions are the one I would stress that, that you have to do it yourself multiple times. And this is not unusual. It's not because you're new. It's just the nature of the beast that has to be done. Which brings me to the last point, be patient. Um, 
expect or know in advance that this process is a long process. And I think if you have uh, this uh, view in mind that it's going to take time, uh, it's a lot easier to not go crazy <laughs> as you're going through the review process. I want to say recognize your bias. And the bias I'm talking about here is nothing to do with the uh, um, social bias, OK? What I'm talking about is your writing bias. What kind of writer are you? We all have certain tendencies. Some people tend to be very verbose. They want to write and write and write. They sit down and they just can't stop writing. They have so many words to put on paper. Some people are very terse. When they explain things, they think like three or four words is enough and they have difficulty in adding a few words to them. And of course, your English level, uh, you know what level of expertise you have in the language. It may be your native language. It may not be your native language. You may be very adept at it. You may not be very adept. Recognize these things. Do a self-assessment before you start writing so that you can work with that. If you tend to be verbose, if you tend to use a lot of words, recognize that and work to compensate for that natural bias you may have just because of who you are. If you tend to be terse, force yourself to pull out more words to, to expand on uh, your um, approach to the language. And of course, if you are weaker in English, then you just have to expect that your revision cycles are gonna happen more often and to be even more patient and to get the help you need. So first thing is I'm going to just talk about what's the journal I article's basic structure. And this is where I'm going to quickly pull the ideas that you can go and look for in these IEEE and these OZA documents. Um, uh, so that's, I'm gonna go through that very quickly because I think this is pretty straightforward. You have a title, you have an abstract, you do an introduction, then you have the body of the work where most of the uh, information is. You'll have a discussion section. Why is discussion different from body? Um, finally, your conclusion, and maybe you'll have some appendix. So title. There's a nice um, video from IEEE just about writing the title. And they tell you that that revision, 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 that applies to the title alone. So you um, start with a title, uh, you try and be, as they say, specific, concise, descriptive. This is what's really important in a title, and it's just important in uh, the whole article. And you can see the correlation between the IEEE on the left and the OZA on the right really saying pretty much the same thing. So uh, I also would add a little thing. Uh, be careful. You often will have work which per, uh, appears first in a conference version and then is expanded on in a journal version. Very important for your uh, career to not use the same title. You want people to be able to easily distinguish between these contributions. If they have the same title, people may think that they're not different contributions when, when typically uh, you know they are. Um, so use different titles. And I like to keep the shorter title for the journal article because it's pithier, it's, it's more likely to be remembered. I'll permit myself to have a little bit more wordy title in a conference paper than I typically would in a journal paper. Introduction, again, pretty straightforward. If you're gonna get a paper published, it's gonna be because it's new. It's gotta be the novelty and you have to establish the novelty. And the way you establish the novelty is of course by doing a literature review. So this is what happens in the introduction of the paper. Uh, So-and-so did this, mine's similar. I'm addressing the same problem, but my technique is different. Uh, the technique is the same, but the problem is different and therefore the outcomes are different. Uh, so novelty, most important thing you have to address in uh, your introduction. You know, you have to be clear. So, you know, what is your goal? Make that very obvious because that's part of understanding your contribution. So it has to be new, but they also have to understand what it is. So the goal, um, motivation, of course, uh, the more uh, useful your results are, the more likely they are to be accepted in the journal. So you, uh, one thing is to say, this is my problem. And it's another important thing to say why this important, why this problem is important, why uh, the journal will uh, attract more readers because they're gonna be interested in uh, what, you, what you have. Clarity, everybody's talking about be clear, be clear, be clear. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about this um, a lot, okay? So in that, that YouTube gem I talk about is all about clarity. So clarity is the most important idea you're gonna walk away with. You're gonna hear me say this 
10 different ways, be clear. There are many different ways um, that you can be clear. Uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, organizing your materials logically. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Keep the language as simple as possible. Use short papers, <laughs> use short sentences. Um, all these are good ideas. Uh, so clarity. There's this main body and, uh, you know, this, this is like the difficult part. I'm going to be mostly talking about these ideas because, you know, sure, sure, what and how and you get results. That's great. But really, most of the work when you're doing the writing a paper is here and it's where they have the least words in this guidance. So this guidance helps you to a certain point, but I think there's a lot, lot more to go on. Discussion, how is discussion different from the main body? And it's a lot to do with um, interpretation. What do they mean? Why it makes a difference? So you'll be talking a lot more about impact, uh, larger context. So sometimes you can be very specific in the body of the paper. This is what I did. And in the discussion, you'll step back and you'll say, oh, you know what I did, I did it for this application, but it could be used in this application. Or what I did, it, you may think it's very similar to this, but now that you've seen all my details, I can show you how it's different. So in the introduction, you might've said, it's like this, but it's different, but you hadn't talked about everything. In the discussion, You've already talked about all the details and you can talk more about the significance, draw out the significance. Conclusion, a lot of people struggle with the conclusion. First of all, no new information, that's true. Nothing new is introduced, but that doesn't mean that you take the abstract and repeat it in the conclusion. These are different, different because the abstract is you're trying to attract people to read your paper. The conclusion is you want them to remember what was important when they have read it. So they've seen the details. So in the abstract, you can't, um, you, you can't assume that the reader has passed through the details. But in the conclusion, yes, that's a reasonable assumption. They've seen the details and you're trying to uh, remind them or impress on them what was the most important takeaways, what you want them to remember. Appendix. Appendix is all about moving details that are useful but aren't essential. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about organization, flow, clarity in the body. And in the body of your uh, paper, there may be some, you know, kind of cool things you got, right? You took a lot of trouble. You did a lot of equation manipulation. And, you know, like it's really nice work. But, you know, it's, it's a step to get to something that really is more important. And if you put too much time there, you may lose may lose the reader. They may get so lost in these details that maybe they, are, they aren't very adept at, but they could really use the other part of your paper. So I like those kind of details. Sometimes I move uh, to the end. For instance, material valuable for a specialist. So everybody reading your article may not be a specialist. And so some things might be better off in an appendix. So that's what uh, I refer you to these other documents. They, they're going to talk about that. But now I'd like to talk about this idea of body discussion appendix. And whether it's in the body or in the discussion or the appendix, you're going to decide. Uh, but it's all related to how you're going to organize your paper for clarity. So I like to say that writing a journal paper is telling a story. There are just good storytelling rules. Um, no sudden ideas. You don't want to have, when you're reading a story, a conversation between um, Bob and Alice, and suddenly there's a, somebody called Eve, and you have no idea who Eve is. <laughs> you should be like, just as in a book you're reading and a story somebody's telling, you don't want something to suddenly appear that hasn't been properly introduced or given context or defined. Um, so it's storytelling in its essence. No meandering. When you're telling a story, if you start getting distracted when you're telling a story, your, le your, your listeners are not going to listen. You know, you start telling a story about this big thunderstorm, and then you mentioned, oh, by the way, that day my car broke down. That's not good storytelling, right? So you want to keep to what's important in your story. Don't start with the day I was born. I was born in, no, no, no. Don't go back to the beginning. So this, this tends to be people a little bit more verbose. <laughs> so, you know, a good story is, you know, sticking to the storyline and not and taking too much that isn't really relevant. So I like to say that good writing skills 
are really good technical writing skills. So everything you were learning growing up uh, in, in your uh, primary education, your secondary education, your university education, all of that you were writing and all of these, whether it was technical or not, is going to help you when you're writing this journal paper. I don't mean that you have to be flowery. I don't think you have to have you know, beautiful descriptions. You know, that part of your previous uh, writing, creative writing, wasn't necessarily applicable. But this idea of how to tell a story, that part applies whether it's technical or not. The order of presentation is the most difficult uh, part of writing a paper and the most important part of it. If you want to achieve clarity, you have to have a good flow of ideas. That goes back to the story. You're telling a story, you have to tell it in the right order. If you, and, and sometimes you have to foreshadow. Uh, sometimes you have to say, I'm gonna tell you how I ended up in, and then you have a story. So how you decide to do this flow of which idea first critical. And I like to say you should audition by telling your story different ways. I mean, literally, this is revision, revision, revision. Before you start writing, just start thinking about this flow of ideas. And I start with conversation. You have office mates, you know, grab them, talk to them, try this flow of ideas. And then when they get glassy eyed and they have to go to lunch, then your next office mate comes in, try a different order and see which one seems to click. So conversation, one way. PowerPoint. PowerPoint can be really useful in, you know, like putting your, your, your um, ideas down, especially with figures, because figures are so important to journal uh, articles that um, uh, putting your figures in PowerPoint, maybe not even any words, but, you know, saying the story and the ideas and then having PowerPoint, maybe a few words, but also the figures, which figures are going to introduce first, how you can explain it, how does it relate to your story. So either of these ways. So all of this is part of determining the best order of presentation. And chronology is not usually relevant. You don't say, first I tried this, then I tried that. And then I realized that on the first try, I should have done this instead. So on the second try, no, no. You take the benefit of hindsight and you write an article that is clear, not to show the difficult path you traced, but to show, try to get the person to understand the right way, the way, the way you wish you had done it. I wish I had known then, then I could have just done this right from the beginning. That's what you write up. It's as if it was most efficient, as if it took you one month, when in fact it took you six months because you had this chronology you had to go through. So don't think you have to stick to chronology. In fact, most times you don't want to. Um, revision, revision, revision. Like I, I'm trying to tell you, it's not just the edits. Uh, it's not just the grammar and spelling. It applies to this idea of the flow of ideas. So you may bounce it off your office mates. You may try a little PowerPoint. You may finally write down your first version. But that first version, you don't have to stick to that order. You know, after writing the whole thing, actually having a manuscript, of course, you're going to go through, you're going to correct the grammar, you're going to correct the English and spelling. But you can also say, no, I said, you know, I thought this was the good order. But now that I put it on paper, I can see that there's a better way to do it. Uh, and then if you're going to have to modify the flow of your ideas, it's better if all along you sort of had a modular approach to your writing. You know, you're using sections and subsections, and as much as you can, you organize them so these ideas are contained in one body. So you don't want half of your idea in the first section, subsection, half of the idea in the next subsection. If, you know, they, you try to make them as independent as possible. Why? Because in the revision cycle, you'd like to be able to just move them as blocks and say, well, what if I put this here and that here? And if you've sort of not really broken it into pieces, that becomes a lot harder. It's not always possible, but if you can be modular, I think it's a, it's a good approach. Simple declarative sentences. If you want to write a impactful article, a journal article, it is to keep things clear. And one way we can keep things clear is to keep our sentences short and simple. This is the opposite of what we learn in creative writing, where we might want to make beautiful ones. I happen to be a big um, fan of uh, Hemingway, who is a, an American author who famously wrote very simple declarative sentences and still had beautiful literature, but different from everyone else from his period. But anyway, for technical writing, 
don't have a lot of clauses, subclauses, ands, uh, and you go on for you know a paragraph that's mostly one sentence, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So much easier to break them into separate sentences. Simple declarative. Declarative means I did this. Noun, verb, object. And that, um, and this, uh, subordinate clauses, phrases, you know, don't, don't make it too, too um, involved. So um, I, you'll see this also in that YouTube video uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so in this scientific writing, she does a really good job of uh, highlighting that as well. And she will say in there to eliminate all unnecessary words. In order to approach the problem, I thought I might. No, no, no. I did this. Forget all of those introductory words. So when, so when you're revising, 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 you go through and you realize that you had put in these, these unnecessary words without realizing it. That's why we revise. So we go back and say, what? Well, I said that. I don't need that. Cut, cut. Simple. Uh, keep them as uh, short and concise as possible. Use paragraphs. Nothing drives me uh, crazier than to get a manuscript where a whole page has no divisions. You know, the way it works is one idea is one paragraph. Remember, grammar exists to facilitate our understanding. Um, paragraphs are a way to let us catch our breath mentally, to get one idea and say, okay, that was that idea. Now, of course, you have many ideas and they're going to combine together to get something useful. But each paragraph, one idea that somebody can say, yes, I get it. That says, okay, yes, I get it. Um, just like a comma in a sentence tells us when to breathe, paragraphs tell us mentally when an idea is over and we're going on to the next idea. So use paragraphs um, effectively. Also know your audience, okay? So you're gonna write a journal article. Who are reading journal articles? You have read a lot of journal articles. When you read them, do you read every word every time uh, you go through it? Well, you're not sure if this article is really related to your research. So what do you do? You scan it. You don't read the whole article, you scan it. You read like, um, kind of have a tendency to read the first line of each paragraph. Ah. Okay, so you know that your audience is maybe going to do this about uh, scanning rather than reading. So maybe when you write your article, you want to grab that potential reader and get them to read your article for real. So you know they're gonna scan. So when you write, you're prepared for that scanning. Uh, and then you, what you should do is adopt this sort of inverted pyramid for your paragraphs to the extent possible. I mean, complicated ideas, sometimes it doesn't always work out this way, but this is just like a good practice. So you start out with the most important idea. I was able to achieve you know, the, the best revision by adopting this method. And then, then you have the method, it's still important, but the idea is that you grab their attention. You told them what it is that makes them wanna read that paragraph. Or maybe it's not the important paragraph for them and they'll go on to the next one where it is more relevant. So this is uh, typically used in newspaper articles. You know? uh, and it, it applies, I think, very well to journal articles, the way you organize your paragraphs. Everybody, all that I triply, oh, as I says, be precise in your language. Do not talk in generalities. The behavior was good. The behavior was um, better. Better than what? You know, be specific, be precise. Um, and uh, this will avoid misunderstandings. It was better and the reader will think better than something else. It wasn't the better you were talking or talking about some other thing better. So you have to be precise. Um, also avoid listing the obvious. Sometimes I've seen uh, uh, papers where um, they are repeating what I can read in a graph. They're saying, you know, this, there's, five points on the graph and they list the five points of the data. You know, that's not useful. If there's a hundred points and there's three important points that you want to point out, yes, of course, then you'll have a list. But, you know, something that maybe isn't obvious, you're not going to say the peak is at whatever, unless that value of the peak is of some importance. It's above the uh, fact, it's below the fact. I mean, there's, there's some reason that you're talking specifically about the maximum because otherwise the maximum can be read. So, um, Add value and not just not just the uh, listing. 
avoid redundancy. Do not say the same thing here, here, and here. Avoid redundancy. Okay. No, really, avoid redundancy. I said the same thing three times. It wasn't terribly interesting for you. For the reader also, if you say the same thing three times, they're gonna, you're going to lose them, and they're going to think that maybe you don't have as much to contribute. So be very careful to avoid that. And that's all part of clarity. Sometimes you want to say something again for a specific reason. It's really important. It's really subtle. Okay, but point it out for that. Note that, you know, not just repeat it. So now I'm going to talk um, about figures. Um, figures are very important in journal uh, writing, and there are many aspects of it that, that can go wrong when you're making figures. One thing is just technically the sharpness and the resolution of your figures. Be very, very careful with cutting and pasting um, because funny things happen. Uh, different um, uh, software when you're cutting and pasting will assume that you want to reduce resolution, you want to make file size smaller, um, uh, you're going between incompatible software versions and, and, and all these reasons, cutting and pasting is, 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 is dicey, be careful. Use vector graphics when you can so that you uh, are not using a bitmap if you can use a vector version because then if you're resizing, uh, it'll come out better. Check all steps in your processing. You may use a nice gra uh, vector graphics um, package to produce your figure, but at some point in going from creating the figure into putting that figure into a document and having it flow with the words, somewhere along that line, you have to do conversions from uh, uh, one graphics format to another graphics format into PDF, into a LaTeX package, all these different steps they can impact the sharpness and the resolution. And so you may think that you have created this beautiful sharp image. And by the time it gets to the reviewers or the editor, it could look much worse than you think. So be very careful in, uh, in that. Font sizes. The smallest font size in your figure should be comparable to the caption font size. So that's a rule of thumb. If it's smaller, you know, people just aren't gonna be able to read it. And you, you know, figures are so important. The image is worth a thousand words. And that is certainly true in our field. Uh, but if it's too small, they're not gonna be able to read it. And it's like, it might as well not be there because it's not legible. Um, a lot of this, when I say the figure, the font size should be the same, you think, oh, that's easy. I look in my, my um, package for word processing, it says font size is nine. And so I'm gonna put in my figure font size is nine, but all of this passing from, you know, creating vector graphics, putting it in with words, all these could modify the font size. And so really you have to, typically this ends up being something you do by eye, double checking, making sure that you've respected this really simple idea of the smallest font size is the caption. MATLAB is notorious for this, and I'm going to try and show you um, uh, how MATLAB works. Before that, I'll do one other thing. If you make your font size too large, of course, it looks like you're shouting in your paper, so, so that's bad. But, but let me get back to this MATLAB, because a lot of us use MATLAB to create our figures. Uh, demo here. Let me see how this works. Here's a figure that I happen to create, and suppose, let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. And I'm going to go here and I'm going to say copy figure. I'm going to go back into my PowerPoint. Whoops, where was I? My little demo. Whoops, here we go. And I'm going to paste it. Oh, okay. Nice, interesting looking figure. Now I'm going to go back to MATLAB. And here you're seeing it on my screen. I'm just going to make it, well, it's a little too small. Let me see. I'm going to make it look like that. Edit, copy figure. And I'm going to paste it here. And let me make it a bit bigger so that they're sort of comparable. And let me go back now to my slideshow. So look at these two figures. Gosh, they look like they look really different. Like look at the size of the font. All I did was resize it on my screen so I could see it. And the actual uh, thickness of the lines and the size of the fonts have all changed. So I could go into MATLAB and say, here from this one, 
make a thicker line, make this font bigger. But and then if I make all of those, make it, you know, size nine, the font size. So I respect that. But then if I resize it on my screen, all that when I do the copy will completely change the way the image looks. So this is the kind of caveat uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention that uh, makes it, like I say, you end up doing it by eye, making sure that the fonts are the same size because there's so many points when things get adjusted. When you're creating figures, you should, every color when you introduce it, there should be a reason that you introduce that color. So don't just try to be colorful, but make color work make color have a purpose. Consider the color blind. This is something I got from an IEEE uh, author newsletter that I've never considered before, but they made like perfect sense. There's three or 4% of the um, population that is colorblind. And let's face it, there are a lot of men in our field and there are a lot more colorblind men. And so maybe in the readership of the articles that you're targeting, there may even be a larger percentage than you would expect. So it's probably worth when you do your figures, we like them in bright, beautiful color because now we have online access to articles. It doesn't cost a lot of money to print them in color. So it's great to use color, definitely use color, but make sure that even someone who is unable to distinguish colors can still get all the information important in your figures. Sometimes we can use legends, which is that little box in the corner of your figure that says, you know, this green line meant this, this blue line went that. Um, but sometimes annotations can be more useful. So instead of using the legend, we actually write the word, uh, the, you know, a label someplace close to the line. Depends on how many lines we have, how, how to work with that, but, but consider that. And annotations can often be very good in complicated graphs if we want to guide the eye. We're gonna be talking about some issue in the text and we're gonna say, look at figure and you will see that and seeing that for us, it's like real obvious because we know our work really well, but that other person who is less familiar with the results, maybe you need to guide them to see what it is that you're referring to. Revision, revision, revision. It applies just as much to figures as it does to the text. So here's a couple examples. Colorblind, for the colorblind, I have two curves here and I have blue and I have red, but I also have solid and dotted. And then it kind of even went to another extreme. I put one uh, boxes and one circle markers. So at least different line types, but or different marker types. So that even though I have two different colors, that's good, but you can also use another mod modality so that the colorblind can see it. For example, in the caption, it'll say blue and solid, red and dashed. So the person who's not colorblind, can use the blue and the red because it's like super obvious, but the person who's colorblind and it all looks gray to them, they're gonna have another means of, of seeing things. Now, in this particular case, you, you, let me look back here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Here you look in the x-axis and you say, oh, Leslie, that's an unusual x-axis. <laughs> You'd be right. So for this particular results, they were referring to modes and a fiber. And these points, these points were actually coming from a much bigger data set. So we're picking out some data from a large data set to show trends or something going on here. And this is the larger data set. It was kind of huge. And you can see that what you're seeing in the x-axis here are these uh, modes and it's, it's part of this bigger data set. And so what we did is we actually pull, pulled out some annotations to try and make the relationship between what were just these names, which were columns and rows here, but we wanted to relate it to what we had showed earlier, which is a color bar, and to show how these color bars uh, sort of co corresponded to when we were picking out certain data to see a trend. So that's the kind of annotations where you, especially the more complex your data is, you might try and help the poor reader uh, have a chance to understand it more clearly. Here's a quick example on color. I'd say, how many colors do you see? And you'll say, well, it's all green. Well, actually there's two kind of greens. Green I picked because I thought it was pretty. But here on top, there's one kind of green. Here on the bottom, there's another. And it's because, I, like I said, make your colors work. And the work here is that somehow these things go together and therefore they're the same color. And these things go together and therefore they're the same color, but they're related. So they're in the same color scheme. <laughs> so when you're thinking about it, uh, it's often um, important to uh, 
use the color to distinguish how people, again, guiding their eye, what should go together. This is kind of complicated, but these things go together and then these things go together. So maybe that'll make it a little easier. Uh, so if I took this and I guess I had a previous version, but I did a cut and paste and look at the really bad resolution here. You can see bad resolution. So careful how you cut and paste. This is the kind of thing that can happen. That I think I, I have a nice bitmap. You know, I can I should be able to scale this text to any size, but somehow it got, got a real mess when I made it over here. Revision, 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 it applies to your figures just as much as it does to your text. And in this particular paper, we had a lot of dense ideas and we had you know, so many different ways we could have presented the data. And we went through you know, many, many different versions trying to decide what in the end is the most critical data, what's the best way to organize it, how can we explain it to the, revision, to the uh, reader? And we ended up with these two versions, and looks good. But we ended up even doing two different versions of the same data. So what only difference between this upper one and the lower one is we just permuted some of the uh, rows and columns. And because of that, we could pull out a trend that was important. So here's this sort of checkerboard and we're talking about checkerboard and you know, you, you wanna talk in the text about when you look at this complicated data set, there are these trends and you want them to understand what you mean by the trend. So by permuting, we felt that we could get this idea across. Also, I'll just point out yellow and yellow went together. That's why these colors were chosen. Uh, just two more figures before I line up. Um, here's something where there's again, a lot of dense information. It's all from the same article that I, that I got these examples. And I could have had a legend where I had, um, you know, this solid blue line, this dotted blue line, this red dotted, whatever. And then I would, because of the colorblind, I had to put a marker on there too. And then this plot would have been like really, really hard to figure out. So this is a point where I said, I'm not going to use legends. I'm going to use annotations. And that's why I sort of put this, uh, oval together and say, these go together and they are from 6AA. And so even if the person is colorblind and cannot see that the red is different from the blue, well, it's okay, they can't tell red from blue, but they can see that this is marked 6AA and this one is marked 4AA. So even though these are two solid lines, if they were colorblind, they're clearly marked so they can be told apart, but it's not too complicated. So uh, you can use um, avoid legends to try and uh, be clear. Um, here also are some words um, that are annotations to the plot, which guide the reader's eye. In the text, I will say, at this point, I see immediate degeneracy, and it's you know, like gonna be complicated. For a distance below 100, when I'm looking at mode 4AA, I can see that these two lines, and there's two lines superimposed, it's really hard to see, but if I put the words immediate de degeneracy here, then when I use the words immediate degeneracy in the article, they'll know when they look at the figure to look at this part of the figure. So you can guide the eye uh, using your annotations. Uh, same thing here, uh, uh, all, all kinds, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I can see I'm running out of time. Uh, I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions. So I just wanna say in conclusion that there's lots of resources out there, um, use them. It's a very important skill. I hope I've convinced you that being clear is like a really worth all this work it's going to take. Cause I also hope I've convinced you that it's a lot of work, um, but that it has a lot of uh, good output. So good luck to all of you in your writing. And I'd be happy to answer questions uh, if, you, if there are any. Okay, it says, where is the part where we really describe the problem? So at which part in a journal article do you describe the problem? You have to do that in the introduction because you have to um, establish, uh, first of all, what your goal is so that people will read it. And this happens, actually you do the problem description is in the abstract, it's in the introduction. And of course you come across it at different points within the body as well. Uh, so um, probably the most, uh, uh, one of the most critical ones is what is the problem? Then why is your solution novel? You know, and the what is the problem? Uh, you know, and the motivation it also comes in that why you would be motivated to uh, why this problem is important and why you are interested in your uh, solution. 
Okay. So there's a question like for definitions. So there's certain terms that people use, and you're going to use it in your article, and you want to make sure that you define it. But is this plagiarism because, you know, you have to cite it? It depends. You know, use your judgment. Some things are, are quite like, what is signal to noise ratio? You know, uh, you want to define it. Uh, but of course, you don't have to cite that because it's in such uh, general use. Um, sometimes you're going to use a term and it's used a little differently and it's useful to cite it. You know, I'm going to use this term in the same way that these authors did, which is a little unusual and not like all these other authors did. So you might want to use citation in that case to distinguish between, you know, to avoid confusion for clarity. So typically in definitions, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to copy. Like when I'm talking about um, software, the, the, the question was software defined networks. SDN, software defined networks, are networks which are controlled by another. Yeah, you know, I, it depends on how long your sentence is. If your sentence ends up being 12 words, they should not be the same 12 words as are exactly in another um, paper. If it's five words, six words, oh yeah, sure. You know, how many ways can you say it's controlled, you know, by an intelligent system? Yeah. So you, you, that, that, that overlaps matter. Remember these tools that are being used are going to give a percentage of overlap and they're going to highlight what are the words that are reused. Um, and so, uh, of course, the worst case is when a whole paragraph is highlighted as saying it was already published in this other, even if it's your own paper. Of course, editors will tolerate you using cut and paste from your own papers previously, but if you published in one journal with a copyright and you're publishing in a different journal with a different copyright, even your own words, you're, you're sort of tasked to put them into another context, into another uh, uh, rendering. Um, this question about how to differentiate what we write in the abstract and the introduction. Well, first of all, the introduction is much longer. Um, the abstract is to convince people to read your paper. <laughs> so you really want to grab people with the abstract. And, you, and there, there are limits um, given by the um, organization about how long that abstract can be. So you have to be concise. You want to draw people in, you want to convince the editors to accept your paper. So there are many different things. The introduction, you have a lot more space. And in the introduction, you much more about context. You get, sometimes in the abstract, you'll give a little bit of context because you want to say, I've done something better than everything, everybody else, and that everybody else is the context. But in the introduction, you're going to be a lot more precise. I did this part better than that reference. This part is better than this other reference, but of course it's all the same as these other three references because we're all using the same technique. Something, something like that. So in general, um, it's, it's what you're targeting, but both of them have a lot of overlap. They both concern novelty and they both concern problem definition and they both concern um, motivation. Even in the abstracts, I'll, I can sneak in a little motivation to say this is important. How do we decide on the size of the figures? Uh, remember, if I can't read it, if I can't determine what the content of this figure is, if it's so small that I can't see, then it's not useful. Then I might as well take it out. Uh, you know, there's, there's no good answer about how big a figure is. It depends on the data. It depends on how, how much information. Like if you have a plot with five numbers in it, uh, maybe you should put those five numbers in a table or list them in the text because it'll be safe space and you can see it. Um, so just like every other part of your paper, the figure should be communicating information and the size of the figure should go with how important it is, how much space you have, um, et cetera. Another uh, question is about how the pro professor is involved in the process. And of course that depends on each uh, researcher. It'll be different. Um, so you have to talk with your own supervisor to decide what that process should be. And I don't think there's one that works for everybody. You know, it just depends on how people work, how the research and the nature is like. I don't think there's, there's one model. Um, okay, so there's a question about this idea of a paragraph for one idea. Um, and sometimes it's diluted. Okay, so... You know, I think this sometimes comes back to this verbose versus terse. 
So um, I can, if somebody is terse, they don't like to use a lot of words, they might have one paragraph that has like five ideas in it. And then, you know, there's not enough information. And somebody sometimes can, can just talk too much and, and have it spread out. So, you know, it, an idea is not a, a quantifiable object either. You know, so what is an idea? It's not clear. So all I can say is that there's a lot of judgment that goes into that. And when I uh, say that, I, I try to use this idea of taking a mental breath to try and help you make that judgment. Like how much have you asked the, the reader to digest in one paragraph? Are you giving them there's so much information they're saturated and they need to have it logically separated into two different ideas so that they have time to get everything in one paragraph before they move on to the next. So I would think of it more in those terms than any specific size. Okay, so there's a question about at which point do we do citations? And early and often, I would say, for citations. So a lot of the, if you look at, you know, how many citations you have, say you have 20 citations in your references, I would not be surprised to see 15 of them in the introduction. Okay, that would not be unusual because you're setting the, the, you're setting the scene in the introduction. This is what I'm doing. This is what has been done. This is, you know, where these things were inspired. So it's a lot of an introduction, but it could be very, very brief. And now in the body, when you're taking a methodology that was appeared in something, there may be details of that methodology that you want to expand on. So of course that citation will appear again. And so it's not unusual to have the same paper cited two or three times in an article. Um, so early and often. Uh, okay, so uh, for non-English speakers, what can you do? Uh, it's not easy. I know. Uh, I feel your pain uh, because I sometimes have to write in French and, and, and it's really difficult for me. So even though I'm lucky and I'm a native English speaker and I do most of my writing in English, so I don't have to face this. I do. I do know how you feel. Uh, and what I do is I use a lot of tools. <laughs> I get the best software I can. Um, I use a software called Antidote and it's available for English and French. And for instance, when I try to use a word, it, it will give me three or four examples from different published works on how that word is used in the sense. And so when I start to use a word, I can see how other people are working. Like those aren't the, that's not the idea I was trying to get across. Or yes, it looks like I'm using it uh, the, the exact same way everyone else is. So um, I, I would say that. And to have, so, so sometimes you're going to make a choice with that dictionary. You're going to use a word. You're going to use your tools. You're going to put it in there. And then you're going to ask someone else to read it. And you're going to maybe ask two, two, three different other people to read it who hopefully are English speakers and help you. But even if they're not English speakers, maybe they've, they've read more. Uh, and if two or three people say, you know, that word, I don't get it, then maybe that word is not right. So um, use all the resources you can, whether they're software or human. I think it's a bad idea to turn in a version that you know is not your best version so that you wait for the reviewers. Reviewers will help you make a better article. They will bring you from, you know, okay to, oh my God, I didn't know that I should really have been stressing this, or I thought I was getting this idea out clearly and I was not. And they will let you fix that so that when the paper does appear, it is even better. But if it's poorly written, they may just reject it. And so you may not get another chance to improve it with their comments. It might just be out of there. Always turn in your best work. You know, don't, you know, we all work with deadlines. There's a special issue coming out. I need to get it in by this. I have to have a publication by this date, all that. But really, um, we all have time constraints. I can't spend all my time writing a paper. So of course there are time constraints, but try and turn in your best work. And if you know that another revision would definitely make it better, take that time. If the next revision, you know, I've, I've done three or four revisions, it's like 95%. Maybe I could get it to 99. Okay, don't waste your time on that. But uh, question about LaTeX. Um, LaTeX is a very useful tool that's, that's used a lot very recently. Um, Overleaf has become adopted by a lot of the journals we're submitting to. And so it is good. It's a good collaborative tool. Um, I wrote my thesis in LaTeX and hated it. And so I didn't use it for many years, but I've come back around to it <laughs> now that I've gotten over that initial uh, frustration. Uh, so I, I say it's a choice. It could be useful. You can still do it in Word if uh, you prefer. 
but uh, it's it's not a bad tool. And it's probably better to know more tools, know how to write it more, know how to write it in LaTeX, and then make up your mind of which one you think is better. I would thank everyone for attending this talk. I'm sure everyone like enjoyed it and learned a lot about it.